Hi, and welcome. This is the final update on Cross 9. The fry have fully grown up and the results are in, and a surprising majority are male. I'll discuss the unexpected gender ratio, phenotypic distribution, and future plans for this line. You'll also get to see how my system circulates water. For new viewers, I'm Ivan. I'm breeding guppies with a goal to establish a stable Snow White guppy line. I have several lines that began with a single male we named Gandalf. To catch up on Cross 9, check out the playlist attached to the card on the corner of this video. This cross began with females from Cross 4, where a Moscow black female was paired with Gandalf. Since this is the fifth video in the Cross 9 series, let's quickly recap. Back in February, the day after Valentine's Day, I paired Gandalf with two females from Cross 4. For months, it seemed like a bust as the females only produced underdeveloped eggs. I was about to give up hope when, out of the blue, they surprised me with healthy fry in June. The mothers might have dropped more fry during the following months, but I couldn't confirm it. I suspect these were the only viable fry they produced. The fry have been growing rather slowly, and it's now been about five months. I can't hold on to these juveniles any longer. I need the tank space for future projects. So, today we'll wrap up Cross 9 by discussing some interesting findings in the final phenotypic distribution of the fry, considering the four genes that are involved. This cross produced 48 guppies, but the most surprising thing is the gender ratio. 41 males and only 7 females, 85-15% to 15 respectively. That's a huge skew towards males. It might actually be even more drastic because I'm not entirely sure if all 7 are actually females. They lack a fully formed gonopodium but have some unexpected coloration. Also, some of these guppies don't have an obvious gravid spot. While their sex might become clearer over time, I'll categorize them as females for now, as they don't have the definitive male characteristic. This is very interesting. Normally, we'd expect a 50-50 gender split. This skewed result makes me think about discussions I've seen on guppy sex determination based on temperature. While I try to keep my tanks around 75 degrees, the temperature isn't perfectly consistent throughout the year. This might be a good time to take a look at the setup for my tanks. Fair warning, it's not the prettiest, but it gets the job done. I've been tweaking it for about a year and there are definitely things that I'd do differently. I built a wooden rack to hold 15 10 gallon tanks in my basement. Here in the upper Midwest, it gets pretty cold during the winter, so I needed a way to keep the tanks warm without heating the entire basement. Buying 15 individual heaters seemed like a cable management nightmare, so I decided to heat the water centrally using a sump. Underneath the rack, I have a plastic bin that acts as a sump for heating and filtering the water. The water is heated by two heaters before a pump sends the water up PVC pipes to each tank. Each tank has a valve to control water flow and overflows through a PVC apparatus or a drilled hole. I'm not a fan of the PVC apparatus, as it's prone to failure from accumulated air pockets. As a redundancy to prevent flooding, I've added backup siphon bridges to the fronts of each tank. If a tank begins to fail, the excess water is handled by the adjacent tank's overflow system. I'm gradually drilling holes in the tanks to eliminate the need for the overflow apparatus. The overflow water then drains into a PVC gutter system, which channels it back to the sump for filtering and recirculation. The biggest downside to this connected system is the risk of disease. If one tank gets sick, it could spread to all of them. I've stocked up on medication, but I hope it never comes to that. Any new guppies I acquire will go through a strict quarantine process before being added to the main system. Let's return to the topic of temperature-dependent sex determination. My tank setup isn't perfect. 
so it's possible that temperature variations could have influenced the gender ratio. The tanks closer to the pump and those closer to the ceiling might be slightly warmer. Additionally, I don't run the heaters during the summer, so the temperature fluctuates with the basement during that season. However, this is the only cross that produced a male-biased brood out of nearly 10. Some of my newer crosses are too young to determine the sex ratio. If temperature has a significant factor, I'd expect to see a consistent trend across all broods, but that hasn't been the case. So I'm not sure if temperature alone caused the skewed sex ratio in cross 9, but I can't rule it out. I'd like to experiment with temperature control in the future. The first step would be to monitor the temperature in each tank. However, my current priority is to establish a stable Snow White line. Once I have that, I can maybe focus on experiments like this. Now that we've discussed the unexpected gender ratio, let's dive into the phenotypic distribution. You can skip this section by going to the next chapter indicated by the timestamp on the bottom right corner. I've discussed this before, but I believe there are four main genes influencing the offspring's appearance in this cross. Base body color, European Blau, Half Black, and Storzbach. While magenta is also present, it's fully expressed in all offspring, so we'll ignore it. Based on the parents' genotypes, we expect 16 different phenotypes. Of the 41 males, 21 had gray-based body color, and 20 had blonde base. Within each group, I looked for the presence of red pigmentation, which indicates the expression of European Blau. Of the gray-based males, 10 had red pigmentation and 11 did not. For the blonde-based males, 8 had red pigmentation and 12 did not. Next, I categorized the fish based on half-black expression. Among the red, gray-based males, 5 were half-black, and 5 were not. For the European Blau gray-based males, 7 were half-black and four were not. Out of the blonde-based males, three of the red ones were half-black, and five were not. Of the blonde-based males expressing European Blau, two were half-black, and ten were not. Finally, I categorized the males based on Storzbach expression. I was strict with this, only counting a male as Storzbach if the metallic sheen extended over most of its back. The males on the left have a more pronounced metallic sheen compared to those on the right, who I classified as non-Storzbach, even though they might appear metallic and iridescent from a side profile. Let's start with the red, gray-based males. All five half-black males lacked Storzbach, while only one of the five non-half-black males expressed Storzbach. Moving on to the gray European Blau males, Three of the seven half-black males expressed Storzbach, while four did not. For the non-half-black males, only one of the four expressed Storzbach. These are actually the same fish I showed earlier from the top view. All right, moving on to the blonde-based males. None of the three half-black red males expressed Storzbach. However, three of the five red non-half-black males did express Storzbach. Of the two half-black European Blau males, both expressed Storzbach. For the ten non-half-black European Blau males, two expressed Storzbach and eight did not. That concludes our look at the males. Next, we'll count the females and then calculate the overall phenotypic distribution of the whole brood. Of the seven females, two were gray-based and five were blonde-based. All the gray-based females expressed European Blau, while the blonde-based females split into two red and three European blau. Next, I categorized the females based on half-black expression. The two gray European blau females split evenly between half-black and non-half-black. Both red blonde-based females were half-black, as were all three of the European blau blonde-based females. I stopped here because I couldn't visually determine Storzbach expression in the females. Now that we have all the numbers, let's look at the phenotypic distribution for both males and females. I'll show just the grid of males for this part. Let's start with base body color. 
Of the 48 guppies, 23 were gray-based and 25 were blonde-based, a 48 to 52% distribution respectively, which is close to a 50-50 split. 20 expressed European blau and 28 did not. That's 42 to 58%, a slight skew towards non-expression, but still fairly even. 23 guppies expressed half black compared to the 25 that didn't. Again, pretty close to evenly split with about 48 to 52% respectively. Finally, let's look at Storsbach. While we expect a 50-50 split, my strict selection criteria means that most fish won't meet the standard. This is especially true for the females, where I couldn't accurately assess Storsbach expression. Of the males, 12 expressed Storsbach, while 29 did not. A 29 to 71% split. Nice. These results are very similar to previous crosses with the same number of genes. It's great to see the expected distribution trends, which will help us predict future outcomes. This information is also useful for planning future crosses. My goal is to establish a stable snow white line. While this cross produced two males with the correct genotype, neither is ideal. One lacks white coloration in its dorsal fin, and the other is weak and spends most of its time at the bottom of the tank. As you may have noticed, many of the fish in this brood don't appear to be in optimal physical condition. This could be a result of the difficulties encountered during the initial breeding attempts. While I'm hesitant to use these fish to continue the Snow White line, I'll keep one or two males. I'll hold on to them to potentially preserve the genetic diversity that would come from this line. My top pick is a male I labeled C9AM. He has a beautiful white iridescent color. He also has a much fuller dorsal fin compared to his siblings. While he carries the half-black trait, which isn't ideal for my Snow White line, I might use him strategically to maintain genetic diversity. I'll need to carefully select his mate to minimize the appearance of different phenotypes other than the expression or non-expression of half-black in the offspring. Aside from this C9A male, I combine the rest of the brood into a single tank and will be rehomed soon. This concludes our look at Cross 9. Despite the challenges, I've learned a lot. Crosses 5 through 9 have shown that backcrossing to a snow white guppy can produce predictable results, but there's always some variation. While this is the final video on Cross 9, I have more exciting crosses in the works. If you'd like to follow along, please subscribe. The next video will be a relatively short update on Cross 11, focusing on the developing fry. Since only a few males have matured, it's too early for a full analysis. Here are some quick updates on my other crosses. The fry and cross 13 are slowly developing, and we should start seeing color in the males soon. Cross 14 is at a similar developmental stage as cross 13. I have something new in the works, which I'm currently calling Auxiliary Cross 1, or AC1 for short. This cross will give you a glimpse into where I want to take this project. This cross 9 back cross produced a wide range of phenotypes. If you prefer a simpler back cross with fewer phenotypes, check out this video. It results in only four possible phenotypes. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.